Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Muscle Intelligence Podcast. I'm your host, Ben Pakulski. Today, we frame this podcast around living your greatest life in a body you love and take a little bit of a different approach today. So today's guest is a functional medicine practitioner with an extensive background in getting results with people with autoimmunity and health optimization. Dr. Will Cole joins me today to talk about strategies behind optimizing your diet and your lifestyle for you. Now, here's the catch. He's what he calls a ketotarian, which is a vegetarian approach to ketogenic dieting. Super interesting. Now, he does divulge some interesting realities about the way he approaches his diet now, which may interest you a little bit more, but it's really, I think, interesting to hear perspective on someone who isn't dogmatic about any approach to health and nutrition. He just says, this is what works for me and my genetics, and this is why I do it. And I think that's really interesting. And he talks a lot about how he approaches his clients and his first line intervention strategies for helping people actually make a change. I know you're going to love this conversation because Dr. Will is a wealth of information. Now, I'm not an expert in genetics, so I'm not able to say if the information that he's providing around how certain nutritional interventions affect genetics or how genetics will affect how you should approach nutrition. However, he seems to have a very good grasp on certain specific genetic alleles and predispositions to give you a little bit of advice on how to work around it. So it does a really good job. We keep the conversation really, really simple. Don't get too deep into the weeds around the genetics and such, just so you can have a few really, really valuable takeaways. So whether you are in belief that you found the diet that is right for you, or if you're searching for the diet that is right for you and some other strategic interventions to optimize your life, this is going to be the podcast for you. Enjoy my conversation with Dr. Will Cole. Just before we get rolling in this podcast with Dr. Will Cole, I want to bring you a special message from our sponsor, Four Sigmatic. You guys know I've been using Four Sigmatic. I've actually started diving into one of the new products and I'm absolutely loving it. So they've got a superfood protein. So it's effectively protein and mushrooms mixed. It's really, really nice post-workout. It's a nice blend of different types of protein. So it's a pea and hemp and chia and pumpkin and even coconut protein, which is interesting. You've also got the adaptogens in there. If you don't know what adaptogens are, adaptogens are these amazing compounds that can help regulate stress. So if you're someone who's stressed and you're lacking energy, adaptogens will bring you up. And if you're a little bit stressed and you have too much cortisol, you're almost anxious, adaptogens will bring you down. And that's the beauty of these adaptogens. And, And it's got seven different adaptogen mushrooms in this protein superfood and I absolutely love it. So we've got ashwagandha, eleuthero, cordyceps, lion's mane, reishi, turkotail, and chaga. So you're basically getting your full dose of daily mushrooms in one shake. And I've become a fan of this stuff over the last few weeks. It actually tastes great. Um, I'll often just mix it in water and ice and blend it for a while. And it's a nice filling snack that I will take pre-workout sometimes, to be honest. I don't usually eat a lot pre-workout, but this is a nice uplifting protein blend to make sure my nitrogen balance stays elevated pre-workout. It's been really a really great addition to my pre-workout ritual. Uh, also, for people who don't like to eat breakfast, this could be a great way to introduce some great protein and some great adaptogen herbs to feel amazing for your entire day. Head over to foursigmatic.com and receive 15% off of your order, off of anything on the site. And if you're not already using Lion's Mane and Reishi and Chaga, I highly suggest you head over and do that. Three grams of Lion's Mane goes into my coffee every morning, as well as my Lion's Mane and seven other mushrooms happening in my superfood smoothie. Enjoy this podcast with Dr. Will Cole. So, Dr. Cole, tell me a little bit about your history. You said you were integrative medicine focused in school. You had integrative medicine focus, and you, for a long time, shifted into functional medicine. But how did all that come about? 
Yeah, so I, I graduated from Southern California University of Health Sciences, which is like a, a health science school. There's MDs and DCs and acupuncturists and nurse practitioners all there learning their their craft. And I went to that school because I knew I wanted to get into alternative healthcare. And I didn't know it would look like functional medicine. I thought it was just the broad umbrella of being an alternative health practitioner and doctor. So I grew up in a home that was interested in wellness way before it was uh, like the industry that it is today. So in the 80s and 90s in the you know country outside of Pittsburgh, outside of Western, in Western Pennsylvania, I was the weird kid drinking the adaptogenic mushroom tonics and the things that you get at a health food store in the 80s and 90s, which is about the same as now, probably more, way more variety than, than we had back then. Uh, so it, then it evolved to, you know, it wasn't just something that my mom did and my dad did. And it was we, because my parents made me eat these things. It was because I wanted to do it for myself. And that evolved into me being interested on a professional level and a clinical level and to be formally trained in it. So SCUHS in, in Los Angeles is a great school for that. And I heard of a guy who had gone to my school. He was older than I was. His name's Datis Karazian. Even today is one of the godfathers of functional medicine, a very smart mind. And, and he was talking about this exciting field of healthcare called functional medicine. So that's how it was my gateway because he had gone to my school and I wanted to learn more about this. And then I went training beyond that and the rest is my you know career. I talk to people around the world. We primarily have a virtual clinic. So about over 90% of my patients are seen online like this. And yeah, but we're based in Pittsburgh. So this is completely off topic, but I'm very curious about your, your childhood. I, I want to know like what types of things that you remember as being you know, those healthy practices that your parents implemented for you. Yeah. So I was aware of, um, and we're talking about little, like my dad was in bodybuilding. He was Mr. Pittsburgh in the eighties. And he, I thought it was normal for people's dads to like walk around in turquoise speedos and have, have <laughs> their mom. I just think it's normal. <laughs> <laughs> have like their mom just film the dad, like posing and getting the, all the poses right. And it's lathered up in baby oil. That was my childhood. So he had, my dad owned a gym. It was a Gold's Gym in the 80s. And was in, he was in healthcare as well, alternative healthcare. So we shopped at the health food store. It was, I, we didn't have like junk food cereals in the house. And, and that doesn't mean that, you know, obviously when I was at my friend's house and I knew that there was a difference and like my friends had like the Captain Crunch and I didn't have the Captain Crunch, but I knew that wasn't just going to be in the house. But there were so many alternatives even back then to healthy foods, you know, there was like the healthier cereal. It was like the crunchy granola sort of that space in the 80s and 90s of what largely what natural health looked like then. And we just have so much more access today and so many more varieties because if you go to expo west today in anaheim every year or expo east in baltimore it's a massive industry and it's really cool to see what natural health and the organic industry has become today it's really cool so yeah I, I, that was the it was strange for my friends like i wasn't the coolest kid to like have sleepovers at because we didn't have like the fun stuff but my parents made exceptions and i think as parents like now as a dad like we have to kind of meet our kids where they're at and they all learn things differently and receive information differently and just kind of speak to their heart and understand them and inform them age appropriately to not be punitive or dogmatic or obsessive and create sort of this disordered eating. That's not good either, but it's striking that balance for yourself and striking that balance as a parent to inform them about how powerful food is and not become, Hey, like, Let's shame people and say, this is all the bad things that the bad people eat. This is about, hey, this is, look how you can love yourself enough and respect yourself enough to feed yourself good things. And when you have something like, whatever, you have a pizza at night, then then you move on. That's not your daily day thing. It's a, it's a treat, you know, and some people can't get away with that. Obviously my day job is talking to people with autoimmune conditions and they would get horrible flare-ups or those sort of things. But the average parent but the average kid they need to find that grace and that lightness and that balance when you're talking about these things what sort of advantages do you think you had if any from having a childhood like that like looking back on with what you know now you know and comparing yourself against people who didn't have that type of, of past do you think you had any distinct advantages in your you know throughout your adolescence and throughout your adult life yeah i, I think in some ways it, it was an advantage because it 
it was a foundation, both on an educational level and a physiological level. Because when you look at the studies of how a large part of our microbiome is formed, like within the first couple of years of your life and the foods that you eat it influences the microbiome in a major way. And just overall, like uh, having those formative years be largely on a better quality food. Now, Look, we both know that like just because something's organic or healthy doesn't mean it's optimal. I wouldn't say I was eating optimally like what I know now, but with the information they had in the 80s and 90s and the access that they have, I think it was far better than the standard American diet at that time. So yeah, I think it, it definitely was an advantage. You're almost like the perfect case study, right? It, it's you know looking at the last 30 years of your life and going, hey, did I actually see an advantage or does this stuff not really matter that much? Because you'll see your friends who maybe didn't eat the same way you did and you know subjectively go, well, you know, who turned out better and what advantage did you actually have? So yeah, did you notice advantages in school? Did you notice advantages in your health, in your sex drive, in your performance, in your, you know, your mental, mental uh, performance? Like anything like that that stands out to you that you know, maybe other people wouldn't see? Yeah, I think it went because we're all born with a different like set of genetics and being, you know, in as the baby's growing in their mom's womb, a lot of that's being formed then too. I think it's hard for me to say. I would say I blessed and I'm thankful for my good health and being in my line of work and talking to people that on an hourly basis they don't have that. I definitely have that respect. But there's such a fine line in many ways, there's such a fine line between health and health crisis, you know, because there's people that do all the right things, that had a great childhood, that eat clean, and something bad happens to them. So I have a humility about it and an understanding that even though I had that advantage growing up, I don't take it for granted. I'm not cocky about it in the sense of they're great people that do good things that still bad things happen to them. So the my whole thought on this is just do everything I can within my ability and my access to decrease these risk factors, to live a long life, to enjoy the good things in life. Um, and that's for myself. That's what I try to educate my patients on. So yeah, I, I don't know if that answered your question or not, but that's kind of how I feel about it. It does, man. Because there's so many things that go into it, right? There's, there's the emotional health, the mental health, the physical health, so many facets that, that could impact it just because you're eating all the best quality organic foods, but if everything else is kind of just in disarray, you know, it's a huge issue as well. So I'm not saying yours was, but just like they're acknowledging that there's so many facets that could impact it. So you know, moving ahead, moving ahead, the thing that I found most interesting about you is, you know, it seems like you're an advocate of ketogenic lifestyle and you've also become an advocate of the vegetarian lifestyle. So you're following a vegetarian keto lifestyle, man, that's really interesting to me because, you know, a lot of the people that we're, that I'm running into now are, you know, going toward the, keno, the carnivore aspect of keto or they're really, really animal centric. Man, that's why I'm so interested and curious to hear how you approach that nutritionally just for your own, your own reasoning. Like what, what are you doing it? Yeah. It's funny when I mentioned that my diet evolved to like something that my mom did or my dad did at home to owning it for myself as a teenager, like 16 years old, I became a conventional, what you would call a conventional vegan from my mid to late teens to my mid to late twenties. And it was whole foods. I knew that stuff from my upbringing. I, I was informed on that, but I think I wanted to do the well-intentioned healthy thing. And that was sort of the next phase of that, you know, late nineties, early two thousands thing. I didn't love the idea of eating lots of animals either. So it wasn't coming necessarily from a like I wasn't a PETA member or anything like that, but I just, the animal welfare and just doing, uh, being a good steward in that way just didn't resonate with me to eat it. And if I wasn't willing to go kill it, like I didn't think it was like intellectually right. Anyways, I became a conventional vegan in Whole Foods 10 years. I felt great. Then I noticed slowly over those 10 years that my energy was getting lower. I had these other inflammatory issues. I have a gen like I have autoimmune conditions on both sides of my family. So there's a genetic component to autoimmunity. Again, this is what I consult patients about. But I have an MTHFR gene SNP, which is a gene variant that you get a copy from each one of your parents. I have a homozygous, a double mutation of this MTHFR at the C677T location, which is a fancy way of saying my body really <laughs> sucks at detoxing and lowering inflammation levels. And it's associated with different autoimmune inflammation spectrum issues. So I think that was part of it is that we have to find out what way eating works for us, like what's optimal. And just because something's better, like eating a whole foods vegan diet is better than the standard American diet. But just because something's better doesn't necessarily mean it's optimal. 
for you. And we're all different with its different set of genetics and food preferences and microbiomes and food reactivities and et cetera. So that evolved to Ketotarian. And that was my first book that I didn't call it Ketotarian, obviously, when I first started eating that way, but it was a high fat, moderate protein, lower carbohydrate diet. And I started exploring in this realm of intermittent fasting and fasting protocols and focusing on healthy fats for fuel. And I brought in a few foods that were not vegan into my diet as well. Organic pasture-raised eggs, ghee or clarified butter. Occasionally, I don't love dairy. And uh, wild-caught fish. So I brought in some pescatarian keto options too, while predominantly being still plant-centric. So that is what I did. And that also coincided with my formal training in functional medicine and seeing all the different variables when it comes to ketosis and the ketogenic diet. And that is how the book Ketotarian came to be of just seeing what works, what doesn't, how to do keto in this way. So while it is predominantly vegan and vegetarian keto, there are what I call in the book vegetarian section too, wild caught fish, fresh seafood, that kind of stuff, but again, still being plant centric. So I'm not a vegetarian, but because I have the fish as well, but you could do it vegetarian. I wanted to teach people in the book how to go keto in that way if they're going to do it. Yeah. So that's what Ketotarian is. Right. And you feel that's the most optimal diet for you or for anyone? Or, or So where, where's your thought on that? I can put my author hat on and then my functional medicine hat. My author hat is this has worked for me and I do a cyclical ketogenic approach, ketotarian approach, mostly plant-based approach where I'll do four to five days in ketosis and then I'll moderate my carbs. And when I talk about carb cycling in the keto world and you know, co-hosting keto talk for the past few years, that it's like a hot button topic of not advocating it in the traditional sort of weight training way where you're just doing a high amount of carbs. This is just going from the ketogenic land to like low carb or like the average paleo diet and then going back in. So it's increasing the safe starches like sweet potatoes and yams and fruits even what uh, like wild rice or white rice, and then going back in ketosis. But you have to build the metabolic flexibility to, to do that. So how I advocate it in ketotarian is to go at least eight weeks eating this ketotarian approach, and then you can find out where your sweet spot is with carbs uh, and fat moderation when you do that. But you could do a cyclical approach. You could do it seasonally so from an ancestral health perspective that appeals to a lot of people. So I found all these variables because we're not all different. We are all different. We are not the same. I do not hold the opinion that everybody should be in ketosis all day, every day, forever and ever. Uh, there's a place for it. And some people need to be uh, people with insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, inflammatory problems, these sort of problems, they may do better with longer term ketosis. And they're using this metabolic state to manage their symptoms and improve their health outcomes. But I don't need to do that. And I feel really good doing the cyclical approach. Many women around their cycles and their period and ovulation, they do well with that sort of moderate carb approach around those times, but they have to build that metabolic flexibility by spending those times in ketosis. And then in the book, I advocate, hey, if you want to bring, bring in grass-fed beef after that, try that out and almost use it as an elimination approach of going off of it for a while. Because I, I wrote Ketotarian in part for the plant-based world to bring them to the middle and I wrote it for the ketogenic world to bring them to the middle because bacon and butter all day, every day for years isn't going to work for a lot of people either for many reasons. When you talk about gut microbiome, uh, dairy sensitivities, people with APOE, gene alleles that don't do well with higher saturated fats, and just sustainability standpoint, they want more variety. That's kind of my heart on this. Is And, and that's my functional medicine hat, is that we're all different. And, and that's part of the reason why I wrote my second book, The Inflammation Spectrum, is to find out what your body loves and what your body hates and kind of avoid this dogmatic, you know, broad sweeping overgeneralized statements because seeing patients like with so many different health issues all day long, if I hung my hat on one way to do something, I'd be proven wrong all day long because we're all different with so many variables to consider. So while we can talk about these central truths and there's some commonalities, there are still so much room for diversity and as it regards to foods and so many other things. Sure. So you said you had some autoimmune stuff in the past and how does that manifest for you? How did it manifest for you in the past and how does it hold up now with this current diet? So I, I got, I don't have any autoimmune conditions, but I, I prone to more of digestive symptoms. I think that I'm more prone to sort of this low grade anxiety MTHFR gene SNPs and other variables to consider are associated with these issues. And that's this inflammation spectrum that I talk about in my second book is that it's not 
like one end of the spectrum is me. It's the low grade anxiety. It's low grade digestive issues. It's sort of these low grade inflammatory symptoms. And then the other side of the spectrum is full blown autoimmune disease or God forbid, heart disease and cancer, these type of things. And then there's everything in between on this inflammation spectrum. So I knew like when I, my diet evolved from this conventional vegan diet to ketotarian, I knew I needed to really find out what works for my body. And people will oftentimes eat a certain way if they're informed enough about food, they're trying to do the right thing. And then they get maybe bought into, they almost feel like they're a failure or they're wrong because it doesn't hold to their ideology of what they know is true. We need to sort of shatter that and just say, what works for me? What makes me feel great? Like, where's my energy? Where's my digestion? Where's all that good stuff that are good uh, gauges for health? And then obviously running labs and seeing those things improve and how food can modulate that in a positive way. That's how I'm managing my health. Because I know if I see autoimmune conditions on both sides of my family, I want to do everything I can to decrease risk factors. We can't control everything. And again, back to what I said, but we can do a lot. We shouldn't take that responsibility lightly. Sure. Is your decision to avoid meat from this reason you kind of mentioned at the beginning, which is it feel right to you? Or is it a choice around like, hey, this isn't healthy or is it just unhealthy for me? And I talk about this in Ketotarian that I still have grass-fed beef occasionally. I still, ha- I still eat fish, but still predominantly plant-based. So I'm not against it at all. I think it makes me feel I feel good on these bioavailable sources of nutrients that are in many ways nature's multivitamins. When you took it, talk about liver and its nutrient density, we talk about omega, like wild caught salmon, the nutrient density, you talk about egg yolk, nutrient density. I use these nature's multivitamins in my life. And that's what I talk about in Ketotarian for all these plant-based people that are trying to do the right thing, but they are not aware of the, bio, the nutrient density. And we can obviously supplement in our time today. But the question that I pose in Ketotarian is, if you have to supplement and you're not getting it through food, is it the most optimal diet for you? And then there's a larger conversation about sustainability and the environment. And obviously, we're all advocates in this space of functional medicine and wellness about you know, going local whenever you can, looking, getting sustainably, responsibly sourced f- sources of these foods. But the benefits way outweigh negatives. But there are some people that don't do well with lots of red meat specifically. There are APOE 3, 4, and 4, 4 gene alleles that you eat higher saturated fat. And it's not just red meat. It's coconut oil too. It's ghee. It's dairy. That can raise inflammation for them, increase risk for Alzheimer's and cardiovascular issues. So does that mean you throw the ketogenic diet out and just say, well, it's not right for you? Absolutely not. There's so many neuroprotective benefits of it, but how can they do the ketogenic diet that works for them? And that's going to be focusing on more monounsaturated fats and clean omega fats from fish. So there's that allele. And then there's intestinal permeability issues, which basically gram negative bacteria, the dysbiosis when you have leaky gut syndrome, having too much of these saturated fats can has been shown in the scientific literature to raise up these this uh, systemic inflammation through this lipopolysaccharides, these bacterial endotoxins. Does that mean they should avoid the ketogenic diet? No, let's just shift some of the foods we're focusing on. Uh, so those are some examples. And that's predominantly a genetic thing. You're looking at specific alleles for, for this propensity to leaky gut because I, I know there is a couple. Is that what kind of the, the reference is? Yeah, not the genetic predisposition for leaky gut syndrome, but we measure occludin and zonulin, which are the proteins that govern gut lining permeability. And we look, we can measure antibodies to those bacterial toxins, LPS. But no, so those are two different things. There's a genetic issue, and then there's the epigenetic component too. But without a doubt, people that have these genetic alleles for like the methylation impairments, I would say that there's strong enough connection that they do have increased risk for intestinal permeability as well. So as far as compensating for that, is it just a supplementation? Is it specific food choices for, you know, there's a lot of people out there with this MTHFR, either heterozygous, homozygous expression. So what are your kind of intervention strategies for that? Yeah. When I see this, when I look at this genetic allele, and I have other ones too, it's not just about MTHFR, I have other genetic alleles as well, that it is important to remember that our genetics haven't changed in like 10,000 years. So it's not the genetics that are the main focus here. I mean, so much of how long we live and the quality of life is due to epigenetics, the environmental stuff that 
turn off and turn on genetic predisposition. So I don't see MTHFR as like the main like driver of all the things in my life because there's people that have these quote unquote dirty genes like the homozygous MTHFR and other gene SNPs like this as well that have no expression of that gene. I see that all the time in my practice where they can have certain genetic predispositions for things, but you look at their labs, you look at their quality of life, they're fine. They're not really impacting. They're living enough of a clean life that it's mitigating these risk factors that this genetic predisposition is gene variant is associated with. Because we know these genes are slower, they're inhibited, they're not making these proteins or doing this function as well as they could be, but there's still so much good in their life that it's not really manifesting in that way. So for me, it's focusing on these nutrient dense foods that I mentioned and supplementing with methylated uh, folate and methylated cabalamine, methylcobalamin B12. So that's what it looks like for me. What do you feel about the people who talk about the negative effects of vegetables, right? So the, the anti-nutrients, the phytic acid, the lectins, is that something you're even considerate of? Or is that just something you don't believe to be as big of an impact as people make it out to be? I think it's absolutely a problem for some people, without a doubt. And that, I talk about that at length in the inflammation spectrum in my second book, because there are people with different gene SNPs and different levels of gut health. Different, There's different cannabinoid gene SNP variants that are associated with lectin sensitivity and food reactions and these, these problems. And then there's people without those variants. So I think that there is a place with calming that inflammatory cascade and helping with intestinal lining integrity, uh, improving gut health in general, if you want to call it that, before you reintroduce some of these foods. Because there are vegetables that will cause digestive problems in people. And I wanted to really explore that in the inflammation spectrum because I see it all the time. And I use the carnivore diet in my clinic for patients for that need it. So it's really an ultimate elimination diet in many ways. So they sort of removing all these variables, you can start to work on gut health. And then you have to look at the macronutrient aspects of that and nutrient density when you talk about how long are they doing that and focusing on these more nutrient dense carnivore sources. But over time, the goal is to heal your guts. You can handle spinach or you can handle whatever sweet potato, any food, vegetable that you're talking about. And then it's preparation. It's are you cooking it? Are you soaking it? Are you doing the things that mitigate these lectins and oxalates and things that, that may be problematic for some people? So without a doubt, it's a problem for some people. Without a doubt, you have to heal your gut and work on these things to able to digest these foods. But I would say this is not everybody. And I, and I, well, I see this phenomenon in the, in the ketogenic community that they're creating un, intentionally, but creating this orthorexia for the layperson because you have these biohackers that can handle this information. They're handling it. They're digesting it, no pun intended. They're sorting it out in their life and it's making sense to them. And then you have the layperson that's listening to podcasts or articles and it's really causing the stress and anxiety and fear around vegetables. And <laughs> this is not a good a move in the right direction. Direction. I think nuance and context matters and getting somebody eating the standard American diet and eating more plant foods for the overwhelming majority of people is going to be so much more good than negative. So that's my opinion on it. But without a doubt, we need to lean into these variables because people have messed up guts and they're not digesting foods well. So we have to work on this larger problem of dysfunctional gastrointestinal systems because people aren't handling these foods as well as they should be. Right. So it's interesting that you're using a carnivore diet as kind of a healing mechanism for people's GI tract. Do you think it would be a wise choice to stay on a carnivore diet for a long time if you're saying it is perhaps the best way to heal somebody's gut? Or do you feel there is some negative implications or maybe you're just missing something by not consuming vegetables? Yeah, my goal is to use that as a baseline for people who need it. Because again, my agenda as a functional medicine practitioner is to find out what works for their body and what doesn't. And I don't have any political agenda other than getting their labs looking great and their quality of life looking great. So I use the carnivore diet variants of that. There's really nutrient dense. And again, this is going to be dairy free carnivore. This is not going to be dairy. So that again, it's restrictive. Not everybody's going to love that, but we use it to sort of take out a lot of variables, calm things down. And then we slowly reintroduce uh, vegetables, starting with pureed uh, vegetables, soups and stews. It sort of segues into sort of a gaps approach and physiology syndrome or psychology syndrome, which involves a lot of stock bone broth stock, uh, stock soups and stews and things like that, and slowly segue them into eating whole foods that aren't cooked in soups and stews. So that can take 
weeks for some people that are lower end on the inflammation spectrum and then take months or years, one to two years to really get to the place of, of handling these things. It's so it's self-paced largely, obviously I'm monitoring it for my patients, but it's, it's degree of recovery is different from person to person. But yeah, we, we could use these for a period of time, depending on the case. What criteria are you using to determine whether someone so much to start on a carnivore or so much to start on a keto? Or, you know, obviously there's there's the phenotypic expression of the way they look, but how much are you looking at DNA and uh, what other factors are you looking at? I'm looking at, it starts with the comprehensive health history. And that's very illuminating for anybody like starting out with this stuff is me just sitting down for an hour, an hour and a half at least, and talking to these people and getting to know them, getting to know the ins and outs of their health, asking these sort of strange to the layperson, seemingly unrelated questions that we use in functional medicine to look at the pieces to the puzzle. What are the variables we need to consider? What are the, the stones, so to speak, to have that are more likely to have something underneath it? So a comprehensive health history informs what labs we should run. So it typically starts with blood labs, an expanded version of that. Maybe look at the microbiome, maybe look at hormones, look at these genetic variants, and then put all that together. So we get multiple labs perspective from their vantage point, what the heck's going on here, and then a comprehensive health history. And so we have all that objective data, and then we use real life as a lab. So we're clinically monitoring just on a day-to-day and looking at food logs, looking at life logs, and leaning into these things. Because something can be on a lab as you know, this is not good and let's implement this. But then life is so more deep than just labs. You have to kind of track things in real life. Because like I said, when, when it comes to like foods, if someone can have an APOE 3, 4 genetic allele, like they, they should in theory decrease saturated fats. And then they're eating lots of saturated fats and they're fine. Their cardiovascular markers are fine. The inflammation's not really high. So we're more complex than any one number on the lab. And it's important to not hang your hat on that and say, and oversimplify it and say, you're just that gene snip. And we know what the data says. Well, what's the broader picture of that? So it's all of that sort of clinical observation and coaching them and being there for them, adjusting things in real time as we need to. We, We have a concierge functional medicine practice for that reason, because so much of life happens when you're not talking to a doctor in the in between. You know, it's like, I have my doctor's visits in two weeks, but I'm having the symptom now. What do I do? So we readjust macros and the types of foods that people are focusing on. So it is the the dichotomy of functional medicine. There's the science and then there's the art. And you have to kind of keep both sides alive and balanced because there's the data, but there's also understanding there's an art to it. And people's mental, emotional, spiritual health, you can't always quantify. And then there's the unknowns that we can't quantify. So one of the things I love about functional medicine and why I was so interested to speak with you is this holistic approach to life, right? It's looking at all the the cogs in the wheel. So, you know, you're looking at sleep, you're looking at mental health, and you're looking at the gut health, and you're looking at, you know, the blood labs, really everything. And my question for you is, is what is your kind of first line of intervention with people? Is it, are you always going down the path of nutrition? Are you looking at stress management and sleep optimization? And what other interventions are you using, you know, maybe in the first line of intervention with somebody? Yeah, that's a good point to bring up because it's if food is obviously a major modulator of, of human physiology and human health, but it's not the only one. And it's important to not be overly myopic and overly focused and zealous about it's just about food because I see many times people get the food game down right, but they are dealing with other variables. They have like a toxic relationship in their life or they're dealing with uh, stress levels that are through the roof or they're not getting proper sleep and that sleep is not a luxury people are busy and they're running their life they think oh, i'll sleep when i'm dead basically that's not an option it's not sustainable for human health and it's really an epidemic of sleep deficiency in people's lives and it's a mandate on our health in many ways so working on sleep hygiene as they call it and looking at toxins and looking at meaning the products that people are using in their their life and mold looking at biotoxins. So there's many things beyond food. Now, food has a connection of supporting detox pathways and helping gut health to handle all this stuff, but it's not directly food. The food can make it all worse if they're eating junk food and then having that problem is going to make it all worse, but it's not only food. And we have to look at these other variables, which is in the inflammation spectrum. In my book, I I put all these non-food inflamers because we can't be just focused on food. It's all this other stuff too. And our relationship with technology, I think that's an important part too. I think when you talk about stress and this sort of 
very pervasive, constant, low-grade stressor that people have addiction to their devices. Technology is fantastic. It's how we're connecting right now. But people have this unbalanced perspective, this imbalanced perspective, a relationship towards social media and their phones and the way it's rewiring our brain and it's impacting our sleep, it's impacting our relationships and the stress that that causes, the social isolation that I see, it's a piece of the puzzle. And for some people, it's a big piece of the puzzle. Right. You mentioned toxins and, you know, from environmental toxins and maybe skincare products and mold and things like that. And it seems as though you have people who are on both ends of the spectrum, right? You have people who are just in the, of the mindset of this is the most important thing and you have to be absolutely neurotic about it. And you have to, and you have the people on the other end of the spectrum calling all these people quacks, right? Saying they're out of their mind. They don't know what they're talking about. There's no data. Where do you fall on the spectrum? I would say... The analogy that I use for this is some people have big cups, some people have small cups. So the cup is the genetic tolerance to stressors. And some people can ha- fill their cup up all day long and they'll never overflow. They're smoking and they're drinking, they're eating like crap, they're using all the conventional products out there. No problem. And then some people have very small cups with these genetic alleles, these family history of different health issues. They could overflow very easily. You can't change your cup size, but you can change what you put in it. And I see that a lot of times people that have these smaller cups, they are having these multiple chemical sensitivities. It's real. It's definitely impacting them. But their spouse may not be impacted in the way that they are. So this is bio-individuality. This is the heart of functional medicine. We're all different with so many different variables. So it's a real thing, but it's not a real thing for everybody. Some people can handle a lot of stuff with no problem. And that's the, the nuance that's lost, I think, in our culture when it comes to these sort of two sides that are losing the nuance. One side's like, this is a problem for everybody. The other side is like, this doesn't exist. The truth is somewhere in the middle. It does exist, but it's not impacting everybody in a negative way or a major way. So when it comes to exposures, so you know whether that be hair products and skin products or water or, or glyphosate, is there anything that you're adamantly against and neurotically aware of? No, I'm not against any of those things. I'm not even thinking about them. I just think that I do the best I can to get organic, to get local when I can. We have people have to do it within their budget. I realize it's not accessible to everybody, but my patient base are normally just normal working class people. I'm consulting them online. They are teaching them how they go and get this good stuff at Aldi and at Costco and at Walmart and Target. And they don't have to be one percenter biohacker, uh, Martha Stewart in the kitchen to, to be healthy. So I think that you can start with the basics that wields so much power over our health. And then if you have to be super picky about certain cases, then you go there. But you don't go to that obsessive, neurotic place to start with. <laughs> you know, you really shouldn't at all. Start with the basics. It helps with the majority of the human race. Sure. So my demographic is really after optimal, right? A lot of the people talk about we're very high achievers. We're talking about optimization. So in that demographic, what would be the things, if there is anything in that case that you'd be like, hey, this is what you, the things you should probably pay attention to most? Yeah, I would. Someone wants to be their best when it comes to produce and when it comes to food quality. I like the environmental working groups, EWG's Clean 15 and Dirty Dozen list. I think if someone wants to be optimal, it's a good place. They update it every year to kind of see if, if they have access to organic, which ones to go for. If it's on the Dirty Dozen list, those are the highest produce choices. They're going to have highest amount of pesticides. I think that's what I do as well. I think it's, it's good. I think it's optimal that everybody's going to do that. Uh, they're just going to go for the conventional stuff no matter what if it's a, it's a real food. But I think if you want to go to the next level, it's looking at which in the farming industry, what produce, what types of produce are they using the highest amount of pesticides? Same with grass-fed beef, getting grass-fed. I, I, that is one thing I do that is non-negotiable. I don't get conventional meat. I can't wash it off. Like the non-organic whatever vegetable I can rinse off in theory. Now it's not growing in the best soil. Yes, I can't control everything, but I think that's all right for me. That's my line. But the grass-fed, like I can't <laughs> rinse off the fact that that cow was fed grains its entire life. So for me, is non-negotiable is going to be the meat quality because of how it was raised. So the grass-fed beef, wild-caught fish. I'm not buying you know factory-farmed, Atlantic-raised food that was like the fish were fed corn. I'm not having that. Now, if I'm eating out once in a while, I, I will. I'm not going to be super zealous about that, but it's not my day-to-day thing. It's not my daily routine. How do you feed your kids? 
The kids eat a paleo diet. They eat a paleo diet, mostly plant-based, clean fats, clean proteins. Yeah, very paleo. And then the exceptions are the gluten-free pizzas occasionally, <laughs> but they're entirely gluten-free. Right. So what vegetables do you, when you say, you know, vegetable centric, what does that look like? What are your primary sources of the bulk of your diet? Mine or my kids? Well, both. Yeah. So steamed sauteed vegetables. So it's a lot of sulfur rich vegetables. I like the fact that these sulfur groups like Brussels sprouts, asparagus, broccoli, etc., has sulforaphane and sulforaphane helps to support detoxification pathways, healthy methylation pathways and green leafy vegetables, cooking them mainly, especially with spinach and the oxalate content. I want to break down the oxalates there and mixed greens, having lots of big salads and yeah, so it's a variety of sulfur rich vegetables and non starchy, like leafy greens. Very cool. And you mentioned monounsaturated fats as primarily avocado and olive oil and such. Anything else that comes to mind? Yeah, so avocados, olives, avocado oil, olive oil, nuts and seeds. I soak nuts and seeds predominantly to break down the lectins and make them more bioavailable. And these are, again, I. I do this for my patients and teach them how to do this. I mentioned this in my book because I am aware of the bioavailability of these. I'm aware of them being hard to digest for some people. And I want people to get the most that they can out of the foods that they're eating. You can soak the nuts and seeds. I do that. Toast them. Yeah, so that's going to be the monounsaturated. Obviously, they have some polyunsaturated fats in there too. And then the omega fats from fish and the omega fats from an egg yolk. So these are the other fats that I, I focus on. Awesome. So speaking about autoimmunity, it seems as though most of the predisposition comes from something to do with the GI tract, right? There's obviously genetic predisposition to have leaky gut. There's obviously environmental exposures. There's stress as an indicator of potentially contributing to autoimmunity. Any advice for people out there who are potentially facing autoimmunity and, and first line interventions if they can't potentially come forward to talk to you? What should they be looking at? Yeah. So I would start with, you can run basic labs. I don't think you need to be super uh, in depth if someone's thinking about just starting off simple stuff. So we, that's actually my, really my heart and my passion over this past year. I've been working with on my team to provide online group classes for this reason, because I want to make functional medicine more accessible and more affordable to more people. So I think getting a functional medicine doctor, whether it's, you know, we can do a group class or just find someone that, I mean, there's a lot of groups like in New York, there's Parsley Health and a friend of mine, Robin Burson, and there's other groups in New York and LA that are doing these more subscription-based functional medicine that you don't have to be super wealthy to get access to functional medicine. So I'm happy of the, the strides that we're making there. That way we can give people sort of a basic objective baseline from a functional medicine perspective, what's going on. Because very little broad sweeping generalized statements when it comes to that. Because you could have 100 people with autoimmune conditions and what works for one person may not work for the next person. So it's, it's, it's you can't lump them all together in like one fashion. But I would say start with real food if you want to be like start there clean up your diet, look at these variables that can cause problems for a lot of people on this autoimmune inflammation spectrum. The albumin and egg whites can be a problem for a lot of them. Dairy, looking at casein, even the fermented types, uh, they could be a problem. And obviously there's different subtypes when you look at beta A1 casein and beta A2 casein, but I would go off of it for a while. And then if we try and reintroduce it, bring in these grass-fed varieties, the A2 varieties that are, again, from an ancestral health perspective, more in alignment with our genetics, the A1 casein, which is in the majority of cows today, can be problematic and is more problematic for people with autoimmunity or tends to be more problematic. And then looking at nightshades, I think the alkaloids compounds can be a problem for a lot of people with autoimmunity. So that's tomatoes, eggplants, goji berries, peppers, white potatoes, all good whole foods, quote unquote, but they can be problematic for some people with autoimmunity, not everybody. And the lectins in beans and the lectins in nuts and seeds. So what would be commonly referred to as the autoimmune protocol, or AIP, it's a not a bad starting place for that. And I were in the more advanced track in the inflammation tra spectrum book, I made, I took those foods out. And then you can try reintroducing them and see what you feel good on. Because there's a lot of people with autoimmunity that do fine with some of those foods. So it's, it's not a problem for everybody. But those are like the low hanging fruit, so to speak, that you'll find more commonly being a problem with people with autoimmunity.
Awesome. Earlier in our chat, you mentioned an adaptogenic mushroom smoothie when you were a kid. Is there any superfoods now that you introduce for yourself and you keep it on a day to day basis or for your kids? Yeah, I think a super that I like to bring in and I make my son have it because he's super picky is liver, beef liver. So I don't love the taste of beef liver. So I, I normally have like the capsules or I do like the chips, like the frozen chip, like a chips and just swallow like a couple of them. I have my son, he's 13. He swallows the capsules like from the purple bottle. What's that called? Ancestral Health. I forget. Is it Ancestral it, Yeah, it's one of the one of the bottles anyway. <laughs> so it is, it's going to bug me now. Vital Proteins. Uh, I think yeah, it's, is it Vital Proteins? Yeah I, yeah, I think it's Vital Proteins. Great company. The collagen company, I think they have beef liver and that's what we use. But there's other ones out there. And I like emu oil and I take that in capsule form. Oh, really? What's the benefit of that? Fat soluble vitamins and good omega fats. So I, ha- I take the emu oil. Terry Walls, Dr. Terry Walls is a friend of mine. She's ta- told me for years, like, I swear by this, like, you need to try this. So I get this Australian emu oil because Terry Walls. I think she's the only one I've ever heard talk about that. I've never heard anybody else other than Terry talk about that. Yeah. And that's how I heard about it. So it was me and Terry talking about emu oil. So it's that cod liver oil, big fan of that. And I still love adaptogens. I love Tulsi, holy basil. I love lion's mane, the adaptogenic mushroom. So I use those. So those are my top things that I find myself definitely on a, not a daily basis, but a couple times a week, I'm bringing these things into my life. Awesome, man. Incredible amount of information. And I love your approach of being non-dogmatic about anything, right? It seems like you just got this really objective view of, hey, here's your health. Let's figure out how to make it better. And it seems like it would be a really great approach for more functional medicine practitioners and, and healthcare practitioners to just take that approach rather than being myopically focused on anything, right? And that's really the, the approach I take with this podcast. It's like, I'm not trying to tell you any way is better than the next. Let's just take these objective views and let's find ways to make you live your greatest life. And I'm so grateful for your time and your wisdom. I'd love for you to tell our listeners where they can find more from you or how to work with you directly. Thanks so much. I appreciate the kind words. Everything's at drwillcole.com. That's D-R-W-I-L-L-C-O-L-E.com. They can pre-order the book there, order the book, where, depending on when they're listening to this. They can, we offer a free health evaluation via webcam or phone. We have the group classes there. Everything's at drwillcole.com. Very cool. And, and a lot of my listeners have heard a lot of stuff about animal products lately. So it's cool to hear a different perspective and your belief of the benefit of vegetables because, you know, People have been eating vegetables for a long time, and I'm sure there's still tremendous benefit that some of these people just overlook because they become dogmatic about one thing. So thank you for that perspective. Anytime. Thanks. All right, man. Have a great day. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that's a wrap. Another episode of the Muscle Expert Podcast is in the books. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you're living your greatest life. I hope this podcast is contributing in some small or significant way to the betterment of your life and the betterment of your attitude, the betterment of every aspect of it. And, you know, I developed this massive passion for understanding, thriving, understanding what it means to be a high achiever in every aspect of life. And the further I dive into the mental component, the cognitive component, the mental performance component, the more excited I get. And I hope to bring you guys tons of information around the mental side of optimizing your life and over- overcoming stressful situations and stress striving for bliss, right? Striving for happiness and joy and always being able to have a smile on your face or ultimately always being able to have a state of equanimity around anything that comes into your life. So that's the ability to not place judgment and not react to situations. We just have this calm state of mind. So as we continue to bring you all this amazing information around muscle and body composition optimization, health optimization, I really want to start introducing these messages around allowing you, all the listeners, to thrive cognitively because it's possible for you. And if you're living a hard hard life right now, if there's some aspect of your life that you're struggling with, and I think we all go through struggles, and I don't get me wrong, I'm going through some struggles as well, and I have in the past, there's definitely a way out. And I want every one of you to realize that you can and you will proceed and you will get better and stronger because of it. So continue to strive for your greatness. And I'm so grateful that I can be a contributing factor to the betterment of your life and you living your greatest life. 
in a body that you absolutely love. Have an amazing day. And if you haven't already checked out Four Sigmatic, head over to foursigmatic.com slash muscle. Use the code muscle for 15% off your next order. And give us a shout out on social media. If you do, go over to Four Sigmatic. We'd love to see what you guys order and what you love. I'm getting so many amazing reviews around uh, Four Sigmatic's products and Lion's Mane and Reishi and uh, the superfood protein that I love. So uh, head over there now. And I hope you guys enjoy your day. Thank you so much for tuning into Muscle Intelligence. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to share it with at least one person you know. Make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. This podcast is for information purposes only. The statements and views on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Ben Bikulski and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. This podcast may contain paid endorsements or advertisements for products or services. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest and products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.